tonight. One, I forgot the evaluations. So what I'll do is kind of while John's presenting, I'll fill out the certificates and kind of just slip them to you. Those of you, some of you I've already given it to, but um, I didn't get them all filled in. So as he's presenting, I'll just come around and give those to you so you don't need to fill out an evaluation. Um, the incentive tonight is Halloween stickers, so please go ahead and take a pack as you leave if you haven't already done so. Uh, another thing is starting next month, we are going to be starting these at 6.30. The math workshop series is a two-hour one. So we figured rather than staying till 9 o'clock at night, we would just bump it up a little bit. Um, but that one probably will go the full two hours. So when we did the workshop over the summer, it was a good six, six and a half hours. So what we're going to do is those of you that came over the summer to the full eight hour, eight hour day, we're just going to break it up into a series of three. Um, so that will be November, December, and January. Um, and we're starting to plan the spring one, so keep giving us your ideas. We are working with our autism supervisor to get one on autism strategies. That came up a couple times on the evaluations. The other one that came up was finding gross motor, and so we're working with one of our OTs, PTs, to get um, some strategies to kind of develop, um, work on sensory strategies in the classroom. Right. So those will be the two that we're working on, but we still have, I think, two or three more sessions that we can fill under the grant. So if you have other ideas, just send them my way. Um, welcome. And um, many of you are familiar with this already, but St. Jean's does sponsor a race, and our preschool programs in the community benefit from this. Our DPIs, our Head Starts, and also um, some of the grant work that we're doing. So it'd be awesome if, if we support them in this. So if you want to take a flyer on your way out, feel free to do so. If you have student runners in your family, there is a student discount of 10% if you register before November 18th, it says. So I'll leave this information just right by the sign in. And um, I will email you all. Is everybody here getting my emails, like the or the emails from Ann Alexander? If you are not, make sure you give me your email before you leave. Uh, we just launched our Preschool Coalition website, so I'll push that out to you. It's got a lot of information for families on different stages of development, fine motor, gross motor. We're also working on having a calendar of events to be able to share with families in the community so they know what family-friendly events are available. If you have feedback for us, please send it to me directly because we want this to be a website for you all and for the families. So if there's a need that we're not meeting, we want to make sure we get that up there, especially while we still have the grant in place. Um, let's see. I think that's all. So I don't think this gentleman needs any introduction, but I will give him a short one. John Fleming has been our presenter extraordinaire for the last couple months, and he is here to help wrap it all up for us and show us how we can face the challenge. All, right. all yours, John. Thank you, Jason. Welcome back. Happy fall. I think it was like 98 degrees when we were here last time. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like 25. So glad everybody could be here. So today we're going to kind of culminate everything that we've talked about, all the modules. And we're going to talk about specific things you can do with problematic behavior. So we're going to talk about some things and we're going to kind of brainstorm ways to do it. And then we'll have a good bit of time for questions or feedback if anybody wants to. All right, so let's jump into it. My favorite George Bernard Shaw quote. If you cannot get rid of the family skeleton, you might as well make him dance. Since we're so close to Halloween, I thought that would be a good one to put up for you. But really, when you think about it, sometimes with these kids that we work with, you're never going to get rid of all the behaviors. You're not going to eliminate them. They're going to have these behaviors. Probably until they graduate school and even when they're adults, because adults still have these behaviors that we deal with. So if you can't get rid of it, what can you do? How can you manage it? So you have to make them dance and you're gonna have them dance the way you want them to dance. You're the lead in this dance, you're not following, you're, you're taking the lead. So important to know. How many of you have seen either parents that do this or other teachers that do this? I don't know if you do. But here are some techniques that we often see people pulling out of their bag of tricks that they use to try to stop negative behavior. Have you ever seen anyone embarrass a kid? You know, for what they did? Right? How about repeating commands? I said do this. I said do this. Did I say do this? I said that, right? Go over and over and over again. Humiliating. That's kind of like embarrassing, but up and up. So it's really cracked up. Pleading or begging. If you please do this, we'll do this. I had this happen with a, a kid just this week. Parents like, 
you're good all week, please, if you're just good, you know, I'll take these to Kings of Indian this weekend. We're going to have so much fun. Get that, right? Spanking. All right, it was good for me when I was a kid. Um, but oftentimes, it will backfire. Oftentimes, it will backfire. Order it. Do it because I said so. I'm the grown up, you're the kid, you're going to do this. Right? Uh, taking away favorite things. We love to do that. Oh, you like your blanket? Sorry. One time out. Right? My favorite one, nagging. Nobody here nags, I'm sure. But nagging happens, right? And you can read all of these other things, but there's lots of things that we do, but they often backfire on us because we think, okay, this is what we need to do, this is how we need to do it, and then it completely backfires, and then and we don't do it. By the way, I'm sorry for all of us, because none of us won the big lottery. I thought for sure there was someone here in Warren that somebody I knew, but we didn't get it. So we're back to work. We've talked throughout the string about the ABC theorem and antecedent behavior consequence. Most of what we're going to talk about tonight is the consequence. It's what happens after the behavior. What happens naturally and what we can do to affect change after the behavior happens. We talked about antecedent strategies, we talked about emotional intelligence, we talked about um, developing an emotional vocabulary and, and, and enriching that. Today we're focusing more on the consequence of what happens after behavior change. Okay? So it's the third leg of that stool that we've talked about. So the first thing is the natural consequence, right? The natural consequence. So the weekend before the 15th, was that last weekend or was that the weekend before? The weekend before? So it's been two weeks. I had a very, very rough weekend because I had put off doing my taxes on the 15th of April and I didn't have them done. So I filed that extension, you know, and they gave me till October 15th. So on October 10th or so, it jumped in my mind, oh my gosh, you haven't done your taxes yet. You've got to get these taxes done. So I started scrambling trying to get my taxes done. And I ended up losing a whole weekend. The family went and went to Graves Mountain and enjoyed the beautiful fall. And I sat at home combing over taxes, figuring out how I was going to do it. You know, I lost out because it was a natural consequence. I put it off. I didn't do it. I procrastinated. I had all summer. I could have done it. But I was off. I had plenty of time. I just didn't do it. So the natural consequence to that was I had to spend that last weekend before it happened sitting and doing my taxes. Natural consequences are things that happen naturally in our environment. Right? If you left home this morning and you didn't put your coat on, the natural consequence would be you would be cold on the way to school. Right? If you um, are playing football and it's a hot day and you don't pre-hydrate yourself and drink a lot of water, you know, these guys in high school stuff are drinking water all day long so that they don't become dehydrated in the game, the natural consequence if you don't do that is you get cramps. You know, and you can't perform at your best. It's a natural consequence. It happens in the earth. It kind of serves to teach us a lesson we learn from when we say, okay, this happened. It's a natural consequence. I didn't like that. I need to do something different. Right? Natural consequences are pretty powerful things. If a kid is playing with blocks and he throws the block, what's the natural consequence? What makes natural sense to happen? He could get hurt from it. Sure, it's a natural consequence. He could what? Upset other kids that are playing with him and they don't want to play with him anymore? Natural consequence. Right? If I say something and I upset somebody, then maybe they don't want to talk to me. Maybe they don't want to be my friend. Maybe they don't want to hang out with me. A natural consequence. All right. My kid, it was time to go. 
but my mother thought I was the meanest father in the world. Okay. It's terrible. I told my son about six times, put your shoes on. Put your shoes on. We need to go home. And it was February. Oh, no. Okay, yeah, it's February. He wouldn't put his shoes on. I gave him one last time. I said, put your shoes on. I said, nope, we're going. I made him walk to the car with no shoes on. <laughs> and I let him put his shoes on once he got in the car. But that was the last time I ever had to tell that kid to put his shoes on. It never happened again. Was it snowing? There was not snowing. It was cold. I probably would have had a CPS call on me if I would have walked out of the snow. You and my own mother would have turned me in. But I use the natural consequences. Look how powerful it is. Natural consequences are by far the most powerful thing that you can do. It's just let Mother Nature do her thing and let the natural consequence suffice to change the behavior. Often as adults, we want to rescue kids, especially little kids, from these natural consequences. You know, we try to step in and make it not so bad. Not always the best thing to do. Sometimes just letting those natural consequences play out is the best thing you can do. Now, if the natural consequences don't work, then the next best thing is a logical consequence, right? Logical consequence. So the difference is, the natural consequence is 100% inspired by nature. If you do this, then this happens. It just occurs without any intervention at all. A logical consequence, on the other hand, is not something that naturally occurs, but it's something that you make happen and logically tie it to what the kid did. So we talk about that kid throwing the block. We said the natural consequence is maybe somebody wouldn't want to play with them. People would be afraid of them. You know, it would um, stop that. A logical consequence would be, because you threw the block, I'm sorry, the blocks all have to go away. Logical consequence. It makes sense based on what the kid did. I tied in the consequence to what the kid did. Right? Because no. when we're talking about like, the young children, yeah. we talked about the last, at the last meeting we had, mm -hmm. that, they, that they don't know so much yet. So when they throw a block and they hurt someone, it doesn't really affect them. Correct. So then we have to go, because the natural consequence isn't going to be the same as it would be if I hurt you or something like that. And this is, consequences have a bad connotation. How many of you heard bad things about using consequences? Have you heard bad things about it? <laughs> you get written out if you use a consequence? Well, I mean, so we're not going to act in supervision, so we allow you would get written up? Uh, yes. uh, any natural consequence or just certain? Just certain. Give me an example of one you would get written up. Well, if we see the two, we see two children playing, you know, monsters, you know, and they should be doing that because someone's going to get a tag, and then they fall on the asphalt, and they get a straight knee, or sure. something. Then we got to write an accident report, and it's just fine. Sure. And, and that's a good point. You need to use your judgment as to how safe the natural consequence will be. And if a kid can get harmed or get hurt, then you're not going to let a natural consequence take place. But if it's something that is just a good learning experience that will perhaps stop that, then it's good to kind of let some of those things play out. We react to natural consequences, don't we? I mean, that happens all the time in our lives. You know, we see that all the time. So it's kind of a, it's a good thing in my uh, my vantage point to use a consequence because that's how we learn. You know, that's how we make these decisions. That kind of sets limits, especially on behavior that's aggressive or something that can hurt someone. Now, there's a difference between a logical consequence and a punishment. Okay? There's a difference between a logical consequence and a punishment. What would the difference be? It's subtle, but it's different. Well, I heard they were playing somewhere and they were doing something they weren't supposed to. And I told them that I would tell them they can't play on that certain person's. I guess we just have to go sit down and not play with anybody. Yeah. 
It's immediate, it's in the moment, it's related to what happened. You know, punishment isn't necessarily that way. It could be tied into a long term. You can't plan that swing set for the rest of the week. That would be a punishment. But saying, the rest of this time, you have to stay off the swing set because it wasn't set. Doesn't a consequence also take the, uh, the blame off of like you, you know, who is the providing adults. Yes. It's more responsible for them. Yes, back to them and back to what they're doing. And, and the most important thing is to relate that consequence to the action that got them. Yes. What did you do? How is that related? Very often we don't. It's better to do something if you can't relate it logically. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But if you can, it's best to relate the logic. What else do I want to say about this? Choices stated calmly, clearly, respectfully. And you want to keep in mind that when you give a logical consequence, you want the consequence to help be a teacher of what you want instead. Of what you want instead. So it's not just you did this, this is wrong, stop it, I'm going to get you stopped, I'm going to do this for you. But you're going to have this consequence because I want you to behave this way instead. If I take away the swings for the rest of that recess time, that's basically sending a message that when you come back and you're able to play on the swings, we need to do it in a safe way. And, that, and that's what it's about. All right, so a child throws a block at a sister. We already did this one. Let's do something different. Let's take the block away. If a brother and a sister are fighting, okay? What would be a natural consequence to a brother and sister fighting? Okay, somebody could get hurt, if not physically, emotionally, for sure. All right. What would be a logical consequence that you could use if you had a brother and sister in your class and they were fighting? Or maybe on the way to your class. You could what? Separate. Separate. So that would be a logical consequence. How would you do that? chairs, and she would have them face each other, they'd be a foot away, and you had to sit in this chair, and she would sit in this chair, and the directions were, you're to look at each other, you're not to say a word, until you guys could learn how to get along, and she would leave. We wouldn't dare get out of the chair, but we would look at each other, and within five minutes, guaranteed, we'd be making each other laugh, because we'd be making faces and doing all kinds of things. Works every time it's struck. It really does. Good idea. All right. Child keeps dumping water out of the tub. This is kind of a home one, but we can use it. So let's say you, you have water playing in your rooms. Sand. Sand play. That's even better. So you got the sand tray. That's my favorite part of the preschool room when I walk by land to get a little play. So sand play. Child keeps taking the sand and dumping it out of the sand tray. So what are you going to do? Clean it up. Now what is that? Natural or logical? It's natural and immediate. Okay. And, and it's related directly to what they did. What's that? I have corn in my room. I have corn in the center. Corn? Yeah, I have a corn sensory bed. A corn tray? Too much bacon stuff on the floor. Yeah, that's so sad. <laughs> corn's, a little bit, corn's a little better than rice, but yeah. not much. You can't get the corn to go through the strainer thing. But let's say they dump the corn on the floor. So you're going to have to pick it up. That's a, that's a, that's a logical consequence. It's related to it. Okay? What else could you have to do other than have to clean it up? Well, you know, you can't play it anymore. Yeah, I'm sorry. You dumped it out. We can't play it anymore. You can also say, well, we have to close the center down until we get some more sand because 
it was used up, and we don't have enough for the other kids to play. So would that be embarrassing? It could be. Yeah, it could be. <laughs> It could be depending on how you do it. If you're saying, Joe, don't do sand, so guys, Joe did this, so we can't play because of what Joe did. Whereas, well, suppose if you just go nonchalantly and say, we don't have enough sand now to keep this thing open, we're going to have to close it down until we can get some more sand. You know, it's not related directly to Joe, it's just kind of there. So we're, we'll work with that. All right? Oh, the child leaves toys on the floor. Famous one. How many times I've gone through my house with a trash bag? Oh, yeah. Not too many. <laughs> but I've done it. I've done it. Pretty effective. Well, did you actually go away or you just said it? I took it to the good one. He got rid of it. Yep. One time. Other times I just said I'm going to do it and they were picked up real quick. <laughs> just like the shoes. Baby's kids are quick learners. All right. All right. You get the idea, right? All right. So the most important thing, though, is to always have a response to the negative behavior. Okay? Sometimes you may be tired. You may have had a rough week. You may have not had enough to eat at lunchtime. Your bladder may be pressed because you can't leave your room and you're just really frustrated. But it's important not to let a behavior go by without a consequence. Well, I, I did that to my son. He was in uh, ninth grade. And at the like eight, he was eight or I stop them, I say, get your 
if they're going to have a cooked meal, you know, if they're going to have enough heat sometimes. Think about these things. Their world is inconsistent. We can be that oasis that they can know what to expect and have it happen for them every time. And that provides safety for a child. That provides safety and security for a child. And what we know about children who are safe and secure, they will learn more than children who are. So it is utmost important. If they follow those three rules, consistent, 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 you're going to be okay. Now, you've got to be reasonable. You've got to be reasonable. What are the factors you're looking at as to whether what you're asking them to do is reasonable or not? What kinds of things do we need to consider? Age. Age for one. Okay, that's very important. You're not going to do the same thing to a three-year-old that you're going to do to a six-year-old. You're not going to have the same expectations. You're not going to expect them to respond in the same way. What else other than age? Level of maturity, so not all six-year-olds are at the same level of maturity. Absolutely correct. You got it. Where they are and what they have going. What else you looking at? What kind of day they're having, whether or not they're sick or tired or hungry or okay. where they are, what they should. Okay, so so maybe what we call setting events, things that might be going on if someone is really struggling and has a fever and has been sick or is just coming back, has missed a lot of time. You may give a little leeway based on that. And that that's reason. Anything else? The what, I'm sorry? Just their personality. Okay. So how would personality affect what you do? Because I'm not logically thinking through every aspect of it. If I have time ahead, 
I have time to plan, I have time to think, chances are I'm not going to make the same mistakes that I might make if I do it as a reaction real quick. Okay? Usually when I have a good consequence when I'm doing it as a reaction real quick, it's just pure luck. You know, wow, that worked great. I'm a genius. <laughs> or what they call unconscious confidence. Right? I have no idea why I worked what I did, so that's what I'm doing. But we'll take that. Plan ahead. Alright? Your choices is another thing you can do. Alright? Giving choices. We've talked about that a little bit in the past. Right? But you can give a choice for a consequence. You can either load up all these video games and TV cords and all that on Sunday night. Or you can do a Sunday afternoon. What would you like to do? You could pick up all that sand that you knocked on the floor and put it back in the tray. Or you could help me close up the sand table and put it in the hall so we don't have to look at it while we're in. You're giving choices, right? Choices are no power. Kids still has power. Kid still has control. But ultimately, you have control because you're laying out the choices. What are you wearing to work tomorrow? Anybody know what they're wearing to work tomorrow? Tan pants and a black top. All right. Very good. Monday through Thursday. <laughs> I need a I have no idea what I'm wearing tomorrow. But I can wear jeans, so I probably will wear jeans. But I don't know what I'm going to wear tomorrow. If I have a kid that's struggling every morning and arguing about what they're going to wear and fighting about it, it becomes a big power struggle, what am I going to do? Night before. You know what I'm going to do the night before? I am. I'm going to pick out two complete outfits. Hair bow. <laughs> Shirt, pants, underwear, and your right socks, <laughs> shoes. So you can choose this or this. I'll become Vanna White. I'm not Vanna White. Who's the one that door number one, door number two, five? You know what I'm talking about? So, yeah, I'll become that. I'm like, where do, you, where do you want to go? You pick. I don't care. But what have I done? Give them self control, but I make sure that it's appropriate. I made sure that that skirt is long enough, that the top comes all the way over the belly button, right? That it's appropriate for the weather. My wife then will come behind me and make sure that they all match. Because I'll pick out things. She'll you put that with that? Are you kidding? So do that. Give choices. Think about it. It's a powerful strategy. All right? When we talk about dress, how about baby? So if you have a kid and you're helping your parents, they're saying, I can't get them to take a bath. They're not going to just can't get them to take a bath. It's a big power struggle. We're arguing. It's terrible. And then it affects bedtime. They're going to bed late. This is this bath thing. What kind of choice would you tell the parent to give about the bath? Bath or shower. You can take a bath or you can take a shower. It's up to you. Okay. What else could you give? You could take it first thing in the morning instead of at night before you go to bed. Potentially. Bubbles or no bubbles? Uh, bubbles. Right? Yeah. Bubbles or no bubbles. Would you like to take a bath with the uh, boats? Or would you like to take the dolls into the bathroom? Right? Would you like to take your clothes off before you get the bath? <laughs> <laughs> But there are lots of choices you can get. What about for, let's pick another one, uh, riding in the car. Riding in the car. Kid won't stay in his car seat. Kid keeps climbing out, unbuckling it, not wanting to get in the car. What are you going to give him as a choice to help make this a little bit better? Ride the car with me or with grandma. What can you do though just by yourself? This mom is struggling, you've got to help her. This kid is wreaking havoc, and because she's wreaking havoc on the way to school, when that kid gets there, then your day is going to be bad because they fought the whole way down to me. What are you going to do? Pull into the police station. 
A toy? Okay, while you're there, you can have this toy or that toy. You just stay in your car seat and you'll get to have this toy. If you don't, then you get no toys. You stay in your car seat, we'll listen to this song, or we'll listen to this song. Would you like me to tell you a story on the way to work, on the way to school, or would you like to listen to some music? Would you like me to put kids' bop on, or do you want to listen to the news? Whatever it is, I'm giving you choices. I'm giving you things that you can latch on to. Choices are powerful. Choices are very powerful. What about bedtime? Bedtime. <laughs> right? Bedtime. That's the big struggle, right? Yes. If the kids don't go to bed on time, then you pay for it all day long. How are you going to help your parents get their kids to bed? Routine is very, 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 very important, but the kid don't want to follow the routine. What choices can you offer a child who's not wanting to go to bed? You can read a book or what? You have to have an or if you're giving a choice. You can read a book. <laughs> Read these Brussels questions. <laughs> All right, so we're going to read a book, we're going to say our prayers, and we're going to brush our teeth before we go to bed. Would you like to read a book or say your prayers first? Okay. Would you like to brush your teeth before or after the school? You're giving that choice. You're putting in. What does that presuppose, though, when I say that? Would you like to read the book before or after you brush your teeth? What does that presuppose? They're going to brush their teeth. It's just whether you're going to get the book before or after. So I'm presupposing it. I'm getting what I want. All right? Your choices have to be limited and reasonable. How many of you have these parents that give kids choices that are really big? Chuck E. Cheese, King's Dominion, PlayStation, Fortnite. You can play Fortnite. Hopefully none of your preschoolers can play Fortnite. Uh, Fortnite is taking over the world. Would you like to sit on the couch or the bean bag? Well, that's a pretty powerful choice. You know? All right. You can either sit on the couch or you can come over and sit in dad's chair and read your own. Comes a big thing, right? Mm -hmm. Legos or puzzles, what will it be? Two things they like. So that kind of leads us into the next strategy, which is a conditional strategy. A conditional strategy. In logic, a conditional statement is one that uses the words if and then. If and then. Right? If you don't put your shoes on, then you will be cold. If you don't put your shoes on, then you won't go outside. If you eat everything at the table, then we'll go to the playground after dinner. If and then. It implies that there's a first, something you have to do in order to get the second. Right? If and then. It's very powerful. If everybody in my classroom has put everything away and is sitting down quietly and smiling at me, we're going to have a special treat at recess. Right? Scattering around. If everyone can come to an agreement, we will watch a special movie. Right? If then. Very, very powerful. If you do this, then this will happen. We use this all the time, right? We use this all the time. We pray for it. This snow is enough to pause. <laughs> then I will stay in bed. <laughs> then I will be happy. That's an if, then, 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 then. <laughs> it just goes and goes and goes, right? All right. First then is another thing you can do. So if you know a kid really wants to do something, this kid that was your most problem behavior, go back to thinking about that kid. 
what is the one thing in that classroom that they absolutely love to do no matter what? I got one. You know what it is? Where? What is it? Where are the wings? Tell me about that. I don't know about these wings. Oh, it's just like little butterfly dress up wings. Okay. Oh, and I said, if you share it with your costume, then you can wear the butterfly wings. <laughs> so. She took it right off, too. <laughs> what is the one thing she hates to do? Share. Share. <laughs> she didn't want to share the costume. Yeah. First you share, then you get to wear the butterfly. First you sort these objects, then you get to play with the truck. The preferred activity comes second, and the non-preferred activity comes first. It's a carrot and a stick. You got the carrot out there, you're going to get to play with the trucks, but first you got to do this. Okay, I'll do that, I'll do that. So we have the trucks, right? All right, that's the way we do things, right? If you do this, then this will happen. First you do this, then this will happen. First then is build off of if then. First then is build off of if then. Redirection. Now here's a good one. Redirection is fun. So your kid is getting a little bit too hyper out on the playground. All right, getting a little rough. You got the jump ropes out there, and the kids are swinging their jump ropes around, having all kinds of fun. You're looking out there thinking, hey, that's going to be dangerous. You're going to redirect that kid to do something else. What could you redirect them to do? Redirected. They left this other thing and they went to greener pastures. Right. So let's say some kid is swinging that jump rope around there. What could you do? What could you redirect them to do with it? Bring it to me. Okay, bring it to me. It's kind of a loss though, they're losing it, right? I'm lost. Bring it to me. Oh, and then you play together. Yeah. And then you show them a good way to do it. Alright. You can make a snake with it. Good. You see what you're doing? You're redirecting from one thing that's problematic to something different. Now, redirection can happen a couple of different ways. The first one is a physical redirection. Okay? That's where you actually walk in, say, hey, hey, come with me, and you grab them by the shoulders and you walk. And you move to a different place. Hey, I want to show you something. Here, catch this ball. So we'll swing that around, you throw a ball, and then they drop it and catch it. Go back. Now we're doing something physical, and they didn't even know they dropped the first thing. You didn't even have to say because you just moved them away from it. And okay, that's a physical redirection. The other is a verbal redirection. You distract them and you get them doing something else. Like she said, let's go fishing. That's a good example of a verbal redirection. You're dropping, you're moving to the next step. All right? Kids throwing a temper tantrum. Flipping out, saying all kinds of nonsense stuff. You know what the most effective thing to do is sometimes? Start crying. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about it. You have to say what it's doing. It is all on me. Okay. I don't even know what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> what did you say? <laughs> I say something totally bizarre. You know, that doesn't have anything to do with anything. You have bologna and cheese. Oh, you say that's a green right? Yeah, I love bologna and cheese. Right? Yeah, bologna and cheese. I love bologna and cheese. It's really good. You like bologna and cheese? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. You know? I say something that's completely just crazy, you know? We're not crazy like nuts, we're crazy like, why are you saying that? That's what you You know? It's just a redirection. It gets people off what they're thinking and what they're doing. That works. It does, it works. 
I like it. It works. It works with kids. It works with adults. You know, sometimes just coming up with something different off the wall. When kids are in that state, I like to get them to physically move. Come sit on this side of the table. When you sit on the other side of the table, you have to look at the same thing in a different way. You know? Hey, let's get up. Let's walk over here. So, all right, let's go back. Let's sit down. Let's do this again. And, and try to get them to change states. Anything that will get someone to change states where they are helps all the time get them to move to a smooth place. So, very good. We direct you to oh, the doo wop. <laughs> Don't know doo wop from the 50s. Doo wop? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, this is cool. This is a doo wop strategy. State. The do direction. What do you want them to do? Only use one do. If you use two do's, it doesn't work out well with preschool. <laughs> you know, she said do do. Right? Yeah. Give them a do direction. <laughs> then you wait for compliance. Pick those blocks up. That's the do. I'm going to wait for compliance. One with that. Two with that. Three with that. Four with that. Five with that. That move. What did I ask you to do? What happens then? Well, let me ask you again. I'm going back to the do. Please pick those blocks up. Look at me. Please pick the blocks up. One with that. That's three. Five with that. Right. What did I ask you to do? You asked me to pick up the blocks. Okay? One with that. <laughs> I'm waiting for them to do it. Come on, I knew you could do it. You picked up the block. I'm so proud of you. High five. Fist bump. Blow it up. You know, all the things that they like to do, right? Did you see how well he picked up them blocks? He's the best block picker upper in this whole time. All right? So do walk. You can always try to do walk. All right? You got fun with it. You want your count to do it. Walk. Make it like grease, you can do a hand job. <laughs> Put it all together, the do off stuff. Alright? <laughs> okay. Yes. What do you do? Alright, so here's a good question. So you give a kid a do direction, he doesn't acknowledge your existence. Alright? So you wait five seconds. You get closer. Alright? <laughs> what did I ask you to do? Don't, don't get down. <laughs> you have to put your hand on the shoulder. Hand on the cheek is when he gets really sick. Get me. Please pick up the box. What did I ask you to do? And then here's what happens. You started to do what? Right? I don't know how well you all remember your 50s bands. How long did the do what go on? Forever and a day, the whole song. Yeah. And sometimes it never really ended, it just stayed out. Yeah. Give you the illusion that the doo-wop was still a doo -wop and going on, even though you couldn't hear it, it's just gone farther away and just out of your earshot. Once you start that, you have to win. You must win at all costs. You cannot lose to kids. Right. You're teachers! You cannot lose to kids. You must win. You must always win. You're going to be sick of winning. All right? But you have to win. Because if you don't win, and you let them win, guess what happens? Uh, they're never going to listen to you because, why do I have to? She's not going to make me. They're going to do it. So once you do it, once you do walk, you have to walk. But what you do, you have to walk. Once you start, you have to do it. All right? So you have to. And you keep going back. And you repeat and you repeat and repeat. I had a kid the other day at uh, Brooklyn that I worked with who had a um, fourth grader. He's having a meltdown, right? 
I got some. I said, come on with me. I took him down. We have a room. It's called Focus and Recovery. Far room. Right? The staff calls it the far gone room. Oh, it's just like a white wall. We're going to be adding more things to it. We're going to be putting some nice redirection things. We have some style stuff in there make it nice. Right now, it's just stark. And we have these study carols, you know, that have the sides. And I screwed them into the wall. The kids can't go home and do it. Because this is when they're going to go when they're really upset. You know, they just need to think, they need to talk, and need to calm down and be able to come back. So I took it in the doo-wop room. I mean, the time I far gone room, I've got my doo-wop in my hand now. Two of them in the gone far room, the far room, right? And I said to him, all right, when you calm down, we'll do some work, then we'll bring back to class. That kid tried everything. People were amazed at what I put up. Started out with, I don't want to, I don't want to go back, I don't want to go back. I said, when you go back, you go back. I kept saying the same thing over and over again. The kid tried to climb up on the stairs. I just went over, I looked in there and said, when you're calm, you're good. It's not safe, you're good. It's not safe, you're good. Safe. Six times, I lifted the wall and I walked away. Six times. And they just started looking at me. They went under. They sat under the center. Okay. I let them sit there. I sat down. I said, when you're ready, you do your side, sit in the back. Uh, two minutes later, I wasn't giving him what he wanted, so he's looking around. He started shooting out on his back. Guess what he did? He took his foot, got a kick. Me, yeah. And I put my foot up and I kind of blocked his foot. I let him do it for a little bit. I said, you know, I'm a big man and you're a little kid, so it's really not bothering me. But when you're calm down, we're going to go back and do this way. Try one more punch. I said, punch is going to hurt And then after a few minutes, he got up and he went and sat in the camera. And it was funny, I'm ready to do the work. I said, okay, thank you. I brought him to work. I walked away, he did the work. He came back and said, you did a nice job on Next time, let's talk to the boy for now. We walked back. I didn't do anything. I was all through. Really, I didn't do anything. I just was a solid object. I was there, I was calm, I didn't get rattled in any way. Everything he tried to do, I had a little answer for it. You know, but I didn't have a bunch of answers, I had the same answer. I kept saying over and over again. I just waited. And it had time. And then for two weeks, I didn't have any more problems with it. And guess what happened after two weeks? Same thing. <laughs> <laughs> but on a day that I wasn't there. Yeah. But guess what? Mr. Lowe was there. He's our guy this guy. Mr. Lowe is bigger than me. <laughs> and he did the same thing. It was so cool. He called me and said, guess what I did? <laughs> he said, oh, did? <laughs> yeah, he did the same thing. And guess what? We were consistent. We followed through each time. We never had any problems since. Not on wood, right? He will have problems. You know, things will happen. He'll do it again. But it worked, but if we're consistent and we're calm and we put it into place, we're going to have the results that we need. Because what happens when that kid does that same kind of thing at home? Mm. Yelling, screaming, punishing, threatening, maybe getting beat, spanked, whatever. You never know what to expect. But I'm consistent. I try to do it every time. I try to do the same every way. We had a meeting with the parents. We codified that. That's our new behavior. Every time it happens, everybody's going to do the same thing. Everybody that works with them has the same strategy. We're all going to be really consistent together. And maybe there's hope. This kid that we've struggled with for five years, every year or something. Maybe there's hope. Maybe we'll make it work. We're going to die trying if we don't. But at least we're going to be consistent. You know, we're going to feel good. All right. Catch your kid doing good. All right. How many of you have a reward system in your classroom? Because the other way you do consequences, you do positive consequences, right? If they do so well, they earn a token or they get the 
move their place somewhere to get this, you get the star of the week, or you get the take home the class mascot or whatever, right? You have this reward thing. You get the special seat when we have our circle time. You get to use the Mickey Mouse pointer, point out the letters you know, you've done so well. Whatever it is, I mean, everybody has something, right? When you have rewards like that that you have to earn, it doesn't work very well. How many of you all played the lottery when it was over the billion dollars? How many of you bought it? Don't be ashamed. It's okay. Nobody? Just me? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't win either. My friend sent me this thing on Facebook. It said, I had like a lottery ticket. You know, I had the lottery ticket. It has the little power balls in the box. It said, you did not win. Go back to work. <laughs> Cross the box. I'm like, yeah, that's good. But why do so many people buy lottery tickets? Yeah, it's the random chance that, hey, maybe this time I'm going to hit it, I'm going to be lucky. Maybe this time is going to be my turn. Same reason that people do slot machines. Slot machines make a lot of money for casinos because every so often somebody hits, somebody sees that, and oh, it might be me this time. And every time you pull, you think, maybe me, maybe me, maybe me, it might be my day, right? The randomness gives you a lot of power. The random encouragement, random things that you can do to praise or to reward are the most powerful things that you can use. It doesn't cost you anything. It doesn't take any time. You don't have to plan it. And you feel so good when you give it out. You feel so good when you give it out. There was this one kid I used to go with. I was coming to the classroom every so often. I went there a lot. I come in and say, how's his day been? Can I bring it? All right, come with me. We're going down to the gym. We're going to play some basketball. I had no idea it was coming, right? I go down there, I spend 10 minutes with the kid playing basketball, come back, he's on cloud nine. I always wonder when I'm coming back. Hey, can we do this tomorrow? I said, I don't know. Some day, when I see you doing good, I, you never know how I'm going to get it. That's powerful because he has to be good all the time to get it. He doesn't have to just be good this time. And then these kids that get in trouble a lot, they will sabotage themselves like that. Get her to five to get it. They'll get up to four and then they'll blow it. Because they want to prove that they're back in and that you are really going to get to them anyway. So then you kind of defeat your purpose, right? So that random intermittent positive reward, that's my favorite thing. I think that's the best thing. Uh, what else I got? The seven basic rewards. This is what I want to finish on. I'm going to go real quick. When you come up with a reward, all right? There are seven types of motivators that work for everybody. Everybody, adults, kids, everybody. So the first one is personal gain. All right, something that's going to motivate someone directly, personally, themselves. The second one is prestige. Feeling important. Look what I got. Look who I am. Right? Pleasure. Something that makes you feel good. Cut your hand biscuits. It's a great motivator. It's bad for me, so I don't do it very often. It's something I'm going to do it for. Security. Alright? Something that makes you feel safe. Good thing to reward. Convenience. Something that's easy, right? Why do McDonald's make so much money? Food is really bad. You know, it's not, I mean, it's not good. When I was a kid, I thought it was good, but now it's just like, well, it's easy and it's cheap. Right? So it's convenient. Imitation. Keep it up with the Joneses. People still say that? Yes. Yeah. All right. Oh, she has one. I'd like to have that. That's why all these little fad toys become so popular. Like the Lewis Pet Shop. You just saw one. Oh, you got one. Or the, what about bubble guppies? Do they still do Preschool bubble guppies? My niece is like, yeah, Paul Patrol. Oh, yeah. Yeah, just, why? Because it's imitation. You know, it's what you have. Yeah. Now the My Little Pony stuff's coming up for the high school kids. Oh my God. Yeah, they call themselves Pegasisters. And they're doing all those things. And the boys are into it too, they call themselves Bronies. Oh, it's weird. Yeah, it's a weird thing. 
The desire to avoid fear. Avoid fear. So that's all I got. Huh? Any questions? Thoughts? We're kind of wrapping it all up. You can ask for tonight or from the whole time or anything that you're going to find out about and know about. It's been a lot of fun coming here and talking to you guys and heading on the street. Thank you, Workshop series will be starting at 6:30. We'll send out reminders, and I'll also send out an updated um, flyer for you all. So I'll get that out in the next couple of days. So November will be. November is going to start at 6:30. November, December, January, 6:30. And if you guys like that serve time, I mean, you all have pretty much been regulars. Do you, is that something you want to keep it at for the rest of the time? Is 6:30 doable for people that are coming from work? What's, what's the next one? November what? Um, I might have to email it out if I didn't say it on my phone. I want to say it's the last Thursday of the month, November. I'm pretty sure it's November 29th. Okay. Because the 22nd is Thanksgiving. I don't think I scheduled on Thanksgiving. Yes. <laughs> but if I did, I made a mistake. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's the 29th.